Ben. Am I allowed to call you Ben now? You are. Louis. Okay. <laughs> uh, wow, what an amazing experience. It's been amazing for me, just as someone kind of observing the whole thing kind of firsthand. But I can only imagine what's going on in your head at the moment. So can you give us like some sample of, of the mayhem that's going on in your brain at the moment? <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess, to be honest, at the moment, it's a lot of numbness. Um, I, I was saying it's kind of like going from, or is going from one extreme to the other. Mm. And I think just in doing so, it, your, your mind kind of separates yourself from the process. It's like an out-of-body experience. Exactly, yeah. I, yeah. I kind of knew it was happening and I've, you know, been planning it, but now that it's happening, it's feels like it's happening to someone else and I'm still in bed in Zelda's. <laughs> is there like a target that you're aiming for? Because obviously this must be quite unsettling and uncomfortable and, you know, nerve wracking at the moment. But in your mind, is there like a place that you're aiming to get to where you can finally breathe? Uh, well, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sure. That sounds like a great, a great goal. I'd, I try not to set myself up for failure, so uh, mm. I guess I'll just take things as they go. It's, it's also going to be kind of weird because just coming from Bethel, now with you guys, and I go back to my parents for a bit who are um, witnesses, and then I'll leave. So it's kind of in, out, in, out. Mm. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, uh, an adventure. <laughs> well, it's in, out, in, out, but even though you'll be with your parents and I can only imagine how difficult that will be because I think your plan is, if I understand correctly, to make the most of that time, exactly. which is exactly how I would do it. Um, but you'll always have, like, I know it's only like a fledgling friendship, but you'll always have my friendship and oh. maybe even <laughs> Tibor's friendship if he's gracious. Uh, I'll try. Um, <laughs> and Ben, who we've met today. Yeah. So, you know, th this is this is kind kind of it now in terms of yeah you know we're not going to start shunning you because you're moving in with your <laughs> Jehovah's Witness family so <laughs> yeah which is true. how it would work the other way around of course isn't right. it right yeah wow yeah what we I, I don't want to grill you too much we can maybe save it for later but can you talk us through what you were doing kind of as a Bethelite what what was life like as a Bethelite <laughs> Wow. Okay. Start with the easy questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, my job was in, uh, it's half in shipping and half in video team. Um, a lot towards the end was more in the video team side of things. Um, in the industry, it would, the, the role would be um, assistant production. Assist, <laughs> was it called? Assistant, assistant director, first oh, AD. Okay. Right. But we call it APC, assistant production coordinator. That was my role, so assisting with budgeting and stuff and scheduling, do that day in, day out. And um, yeah, and then all the standard Bethel stuff as well, so morning worship and family watchtower study. And yeah, I, in lockdown it got, or it is still very strange. Um, things are opening up in America at the moment, um, in the branch, but here in Germany everything's still under restrictions right now. Mm. So, um, so it's quite, you're stuck in that environment. So you go to work and you come home and there's no rest bite, you know? If you take, because I know you said it will be six years in total, but let's say I've been saying over five years to be ultra careful right. legally. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you take, if you take those, if you take say five years of your time in Bethel mm -hmm. and you describe an average day, a typical day in that five years. Yeah. You have morning worship and, and then what? Um, yeah, so, so you're, I mean, in the really good days, you're like dressed for morning worship in like suit and tie. Mm. So then you get changed into work clothes, go to work, pack in literature for let's say Ghana or something, go around the factory. Um, then maybe you have some meetings or something to tune into. 
lunch in the good old days, you get changed back into your suit, go to lunch. Um, cafe. Good old days before lockdown. Uh, well, in in Celtas, the the they started renovating before mm. the pandemic, so they stopped eating altogether, which was like the best thing ever. Mm. Um, but in normal Bethels, that's still hap- well, it's starting to happen again. Mm. Um, so eat all together with lunch, go back, get changed again into work clothes, um, go to work for, you know, until five, you maybe have your tea break or whatever, or coffee break. Mm. And uh, yeah, then the, that day's finished, then you're, let's say maybe you've got your, your meeting or something, so you've got like an hour to eat or do anything you've got to do, you've got a meeting, then you going to stay and encourage everyone after then you come home then maybe you've got I don't know your laundry or something to prepare for the next morning get that sent off and I've heard stories about Bethelite laundry (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah I'm trying to think if there's any there's tons of like little things that I'm sure I'm forgetting but it's a regimented life isn't it yeah is it going to be weird to transition from such a regimented life to just doing things however you want to do? <laughs> I've, I've been saying that actually to everyone who's been asking, like, what's, how do you feel? What's, what's going to be the biggest change? And I said, right now, honestly, it feels so, so weird to think that I'm going to choose what to eat every day. Yeah. It's like a really genuinely weird thought like i just show up and eat what, mm. and maybe i don't like it but it is what it is and yeah but till every day normal people are deciding what they eat and it's yeah. like i remember being normal like that and now now it feels weird and you'll be eating in your normal clothes because <laughs> yeah. let's face it it's not normal is it to dress up in a suit to go and eat True. Under normal circumstances, you'd be worried about protecting your suit from food stains and therefore you'd prefer to eat in your work clothes than in your suit. But it's yeah. all about the, I don't know, the aesthetic and the... Especially the, for like tours, I think that was really important for them mm. is that when you come to Bethel, like you're seeing the experience. Mm. So like for, for a while, you could pick up food in your work clothes, but you had to do it like at the back of the dining room behind a pillar so no one saw wow. you. Wow, okay. So it's, it's very much an, a, an appearance uh, aspect, I'd say. Mm. Yeah. Are you pleased with how the extraction went? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a Saturday, if there's one thing you know about witnesses, Saturday morning they're gonna be in ministry, so it's pretty smooth, everyone was in their rooms on their Zoom calls and yeah. So, so far so good, yeah. As long as I don't end up dead in a ditch somewhere. Apart from that guy over there with binoculars, no one's watching us. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've ma- we've made it this far. I think I think it's been a success. What we're going to do now is I'm going to take you to Croatia to the Wolf Slayer, <laughs> uh, the, the nerve centre of international apostasy, and we've. <laughs> We've actually uh, got a place set up for you. There's a, a resort over the road from our house. Oh, it's a we've, resort? <laughs> we've, yeah, we've checked you into, it's actually a log cabin surrounded okay. by fields with deer. So you'll have your own log cabin. <laughs> you'll be, there's a, a swimming pool, a sauna and a jacuzzi. You'll be able to just relax for all of tomorrow. You'll, we're there if you want to see us, but if you don't want to see us, and you... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just too honest. <laughs> it's a bit too honest. To be honest. We'll, we'll, we'll cut that too bit soon, out. Too soon, too <laughs> soon. Um, but yeah, you can just relax tomorrow. And what I thought was, if in two days we can pick up the thread and we can, that will give you more time to process what's just happened. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. Yeah, thank you. So viewers, you will see us two days later. Ben, it's two days later. We are at a resort that is conveniently just a couple of minutes away from where I live. And I've put you in this log cabin (laughs) so so that you can hopefully process what's been happening. Because 
I think it was a stressful situation, wasn't it, when we boosted you from Celsius? You think? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Well, Tibor and I were going over the footage, and obviously by this point, viewers will have seen the footage for themselves, but it was obvious to us that you were terrified in that situation when you got in the car. Um, yeah, that's a fair assessment of the, of the situation. Um, what was going through your mind? Well, because suddenly it's, there's um, questions or, or, or you're not safe anywhere anymore. So Bethel, like if Bethel see me in filming something, that's a, that's a big problem for me mm. currently. Mm. It's just all of a sudden you're, you're facing uneasiness on all sides. So it just take what, maybe one cyclist from Bethel to go by, to see you, to see you filming, go, that's Ben, what's going on? Problem. On the other side for me, I don't know any of you. This is all very new. Are these guys gonna throw me off a cliff? Or, so everywhere is now uneasy. And going from, from Bethel day in, day out, you know exactly where you're going, what you're doing, who you're gonna see, what you're gonna eat, to this world of uneasiness in like six steps was, was um, an experience. <laughs> ben, German Ben, as we're calling him. Yes. He was quite, he was kind of reassuring you a bit, wasn't he? He was a little bit more kind of. Yeah, I, um, he, yeah, we were just chatting in the car to him kind of eased, eased things up a little bit for me just to, to humanize <laughs> suddenly the, the other side, I guess. Wow. And then when we got on the road, obviously we did our shooting at the recovery location, the recovery location. And then we began like a 10 hour, ended up being more than 10 hours due to traffic jams, but we began this long journey back. And it was fascinating for me because you were telling me more facets of your story. And I hope you don't mind me saying on camera, I learned that you're not just a Bethelite, you're also gay mm -hmm. and an elder. Right. So that for me is, I think that's a really important element of your story because number one, there'll be many Jehovah's Witnesses and ex-Jehovah's Witnesses watching this who have had their lives ruined through the organization's stance on homosexuality. And also the fact that you, you were an elder or are an elder, sorry, still, at this <laughs> pre precise moment. That's correct. Um, it's important, again, to highlight just how, how possible it is to be in a position of, you know, respect and authority in the organisation and still be able to develop doubts. So um, talk us through what it's been like to be in the organisation, in the centre of the organisation as a Bethelite, and be supporting a religion that's essentially denying who you are as a person. <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess you just, well, I can't speak for other people, but for me, I um, came to terms pretty early on that this is just something that, it wasn't a question of, oh my goodness, my religion doesn't fit who I am. It's, oh, I, there is something wrong with me and I need to change that to fit the true religion, you know? Um, so I came to terms with that pretty early on and didn't really, like, fully reconsider that whole conversation I had had with myself until, like, after I'd woken up. That was really important, actually, that I didn't have any bias considering everything because I, I ha would naturally have a... Um, a bias towards wanting it to be untrue because then it would f let me be free in a sense. Um, but that would then, I felt, taint my judgment. So it really, any time that I would even think, oh, wait a sec, that might mean this, it was like, no, I, I don't want to think about that because that's going to make me want to or lean in a direction. So I was very much, uh, that came after the waking up process for me. It's like this realization that you haven't got to like, hide away, I guess, is the right terminology. You were convinced that the problem was with you um, yeah. rather than it being an issue with 
you know, religion in general or the Bible or specifically Jehovah's Witnesses. And it must have been particularly grating or upsetting or distressing when Stephen Lett gave that talk. I was thinking, as an example, a homosexual. Now, this former homosexual comes back in the resurrection, and he really thought, and he, he was taught, and he came to believe that God accepted him with that lifestyle. But now he's going to learn about Jehovah's moral standards. And he's going to learn that Jehovah will not lower his standard to accommodate us. We have to come up to Jehovah's standard. Will he change? Will he adjust? It'll be up to him. But you brothers and sisters will help such ones. So what was it like <laughs> actually watching that talk as someone who, has, who had this conflict yeah you know this this religious conflict with his sexuality what was it like watching that talk and hearing that all of a sudden actually you can be resurrected into a perfect body with this quote unquote anomaly with this defect is, is how they see it yeah there was <laughs> so much has happened since then yeah but i i i knew that like previously witnesses had said like maybe this date's going to be i'm again it hadn't turned out and like people who weren't strong enough in the truth had left over it and things like that. And I, you know, that they, those were kind of facts to me and okay, I knew that happened. And then during that talk, it was the first time I could actually, I got that feeling because all of a sudden it was like for, for 26 years, I guess in that case, the, it's like, okay, if you, once you get to paradise, you're, you know, you're good. So, you know, constant fear that you're not going to get to paradise. But if you do, then you're good. You've done it. Good job. Everyone has challenges and you've overcome it. But, but then when you sit there and just in a moment and, and not even like a big showstopper announcement where everyone's like, oh, can you believe that talk where this happened? Just in almost a passing statement the whole, my whole future changed to, oh no, no, you thought you had to get to paradise, but now you've got to get to paradise and then do a thousand year. And still work on this issue. Right. Yeah. Like the, the, the murderer down the road, like if he does all the right stuff, he comes back and he's great. Mm. But you, who, who knew the truth, knew the true God, did everything right, did, you know, went through the challenge, have a thousand years. So like you think it's hard at 26. Like mm. if suddenly every, the whole future changed just based on this comment. Mm. And it, it was an amazing moment of like, this, this could change, this changed in a moment. And like anything can change at any time. Mm. And like, I wasn't questioning if that was kind of true or not at that stage. It was just a, but you can, you can just change it. Like, I can't, ch I can't say, well, I'd like this, or I think actually this means that, but, but they, can, they can just come out with a talk and say, yeah, I mean, there's not gonna be lions in paradise, and your dream is just shattered, mm. because that's now what, what you believe. And that was a really, uh, yeah, really <laughs> powerful moment, I think. You were still indoctrinated and still believing it was the truth after that talk and you were, if I'm understanding you correctly, you were thinking, well, this is just one of those tests of my faith where I need to persevere. Uh, just like in the past when they've predicted things and they haven't come true, I need to persevere through this. But do you think it's possible that that moment might have been like removing one of the Jenga blocks, you know, in terms of preparing you mentally and emotionally for what was to follow? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'd say that I was fully still in at that point. I'd, the process, I think, had probably, probably already begun. Mm. But it was a, a moment where I could suddenly relate to the people who had previously left um, because of a failed prediction or something. Where up until that point, I thought, well, why would you, you know, just stick with it and you've come this far and, and why I couldn't relate to someone who had, or imagine what that, why you would do that. But, but in that moment, yeah, maybe not like a Jenga block, but maybe like a fence had been lifted to let you go the next step because 
anything can change at any time. So even if, you know, you're, no matter what you really believe or how you see the future going, that can totally change overnight. So you've got to be like basically not so much convinced necessarily on the exact beliefs, but on the channel that will change, could change at any time. Mm -hmm. I guess that was, the, that was, yeah, pushing or pushing me in a direction or, or helping me to, and helping me on the journey, I guess. In terms of your sexuality and your future and the potential for relationships, do you feel as though you're in a much better place now than you were only a few days ago? Um, yeah, that's the first assessment. I don't know if I... Yes, it's, it's, it's better, but I, it's... I feel like very, uh, very early on that road. Like it's yeah. quite. Well, you were saying that only was it like three months ago, yeah. you were still uh, uh, like internally identifying as bisexual, <laughs> right? And it's only like like in the last three months that you've come to the realization. No, it's like it's not like it's fifty fifty. Yeah, it's more like it's weird. Yeah. It's it's because you because i hadn't ha had these conversations because you can't have these conversations no. with yourself i mean mm. so so in like kind of the wake up process i kind of thought well this is something i could and can revisit great but i hadn't really let go of the fact that you haven't got a oh there's not a, a necessity to fit in so the immediate reaction was what well, this kind of all now coexist so you know i can be bisexual and and then great and it took a long time to realize what well, actually i feel like i'm just doing this bit to fit in and or to make myself more palatable to people but i don't actually have to do that mm. i mean all of the friends that i had or currently as of today have um are not going to speak to me for other reasons. So mm -hmm. there's no point hanging on to something to try and make yourself um, acceptable in that way when it's, it's, you have other issues uh, for them. Yeah, so that was, that was a process that had come after. Like I say, I didn't want it to really affect the, the waking up process. Mm -hmm. um, but afterwards, it was like, okay, I'm bisexual. And then eventually I thought, well, <laughs> You know, if I can tick a box or, or narrow it down, no. If I, I'm able to tick a box and narrow it down, so why am I not doing that? Mm. It, that was a strange, and still is a bit strange, that whole um, <laughs> world of relationships and... Yeah, that's still very new. But I but you're right. It's a I'm in a better position today than last week or yeah. Any time before that, I guess. <laughs> On our trip, it was again a long trip and it was delayed by traffic jam after traffic jam and we actually arrived here at like two in the morning eventually, didn't we? Um but it, it gave us a lot a lot of time to talk. And you were very generous in sharing some of your kind of... You were giving us the scoop, basically, on <laughs> what it was like working, not just in Bethel, but also in this new thing, relatively new thing, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the, the video making, the, the kind of obsession with making videos that we've seen only in the last sort of six or seven years. Um, because I've spoken to a lot of ex-Bethelites and because of when they were in Bethel or what role they were doing, they don't know the things that you know. And you're planning on creating your own YouTube channel, which hopefully by now is up. There will be a link in the description. <laughs> um, and you're going to be, if I understand correctly, going through point by point um, what you know on these different areas can you give us kind of like a, a glimpse or a teaser as to some of the some of the goss you have to share on each of these things yeah i kind of like in the process i thought um 
No, I have to share my story, but I felt some kind of, um, some, um, what's the word? Duty or drive right, or... Right, exactly. Yeah, some yeah. Kind, I had to Compulsion. tell others with, about my story. Yeah. So that's going to happen because of, because of my conscience. Um, but then I realized I've got all these other things that I would want to know in a parallel universe where I'm not in Bethel, you know? And I thought, well, if I'm not going to do it for fear of repercussions or whatever, they're like, who? I'm just, I just so happen to be in a position to be able to do it. Mm. So I felt kind of compelled to, that's the word, to, um, to, to speak about these interesting things. Like mm. um, I wrote a list of things that I wanted to speak about. And some of them I think, you know, maybe <laughs> no one is interested in this. And other, other things maybe like, like how um, women or sisters are treated in Bethel and how that whole um, dynamic is. Because um, it changes, or it has completely changed in my time in Bethel. Um, that's a whole conversation I f if I'm, or not a conversation, but an observation that I found so interesting, even as a um, Pimmy witness, or um, like on a Bethel tour, how you kind of present a image of Bethel that isn't really the the actuality you're kind of given a you're you're told i think if, if i can remember correctly you're told that you aren't allowed to say anything negative even if it's yeah, true for sure and even if it's actually what you think yes and on the subject of women yeah am i right in saying that when they do the watchtower the bethel family watchtower study the women aren't allowed to comment yes it, it in in my in the branches i'd served in that's true in some of the smaller ones um yes but as soon as you get to a certain size they stop the sisters commenting to get around the brothers quicker if you are a woman versus a man what's is there a stronger likelihood of doing menial work at bethel laundry cleaning i feel like you know the answer to that <laughs> question um yes because you're not going to be able to um have i mean maybe there's like two three sisters who have like office proper office jobs mm. i mean Maybe you're doing some paperwork or something for a brother or your, your um, opportunities for growth are little to none, I would say. Mm. Um, in the same way that it is in the congregation, just in a work setting. I was fascinated by the story. I, I hope you don't mind if I... Please. Because it's all flooding back to me now. Uh -huh. Tell us about the $5,000 thing because you were involved in... Your whole job was, you know, managing the budgeting of video projects. And what you said was that there, there are actual policies for how to deal with various things, including a policy for what to do if a cast member disfellowships, yeah. gets disfellowshipped or disassociated, which hasn't happened yet. To my knowledge. To, to our knowledge, yeah. but there's a policy in place for if that happens. And there's also kind of like a price list of how much how much to budget for certain types of video and you the last one you worked on was i think the the one from this year's convention uh, about the circuit overseer who's single and brothers are pestering him to not be single basically <laughs> and you were involved in that project and that was the five thousand that was a five thousand dollar uh project wasn't it um Yes, so that kind of production typically is mm. is that's you depending on the type of production you'll get generally a, a standardized budget. So mm. like a dramatization, something like that. This kind of project for on a Christian singles um, is typically uh, about five thousand, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, but again, there's kind of interesting scenarios or um interesting nuance to that as well like a caleb and sophia video you think well that's probably going to cost a lot of money because of all the animation but in actuality it doesn't cost anything because you just put some bethelites 
in a room <laughs> yeah. and say, work on this for this long. And Everything's done in computer programs. Exactly, yeah. which you've already got. So the budget is nothing. Mm. Whereas maybe a nice little animal video, they're not going to go and shoot these animals. They need to buy that footage and that will cost uh, extremely more than maybe even more than a, than a dramatization. So yeah, so the, the uh, budgeting thing, I'm, <laughs> I'm careful not to say so much that I then get sued out of existence, but... Um, but I think it's interesting because five, it's $5,000 for, I think if memory serves, for example, the circuit overseer video is, it's going to be like three or four minutes, thereabouts. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of money for only a few minutes, but it's actually, in terms of filmmaking, peanuts, because under normal circumstances, you'd have to be paying talent, wouldn't you? Exactly. And these are all volunteers who yeah. are working, so. Yeah, I don't think it's a, a, a crazy um, amount that I, that, um, that I feel is unjustified. It's quite a small amount, obviously, if you were paying the people, mm. Um, even more so, um, but it is definitely interesting where the limits are set in terms of um, budgeting financially or with the man hours that someone could work on the project. I find it kind of interesting, so maybe someone else does. <laughs> and again on this project, because it, it's kind of, it's very recent and it's the last, I think the last one that you worked on, if I'm correct. Probably, yeah. Am I right? Am I right in saying that Mark Sanderson forced it through? Um, this is what I'd heard. <laughs> I didn't hear it from his mouth, but I'd heard that um, it was something that he was very passionate about getting done. So, Which we can kind of figure out because he is single, isn't he? And so I've heard. <laughs> it seems to be, it looks, to, to me at least, like this is something that, he's, that irritates him personally for whatever reason. And so that's probably why he would have a vested interest in forcing it through. Yeah, I, I f that would be a logical conclusion to come yeah. to, for sure. Okay. And talk to us about the, the governing body assistants, because you met Samuel Hurd, didn't you? Right. And you, you shared a really interesting story about how every, he wanted, everything had to be run through his assistant or something. Yeah, it's... Um, so we were at the international convention in Berlin and we had to film stuff. We actually didn't really know what we had to film, but we were filming anyway. And, um, and we went to um, find what I've heard and, um, and we asked him like basically what he'd kind of be willing to do, how, if we, how we could get him in shots and whatever, film the talks. And it was, that was a very interesting dynamic. Again, it was pre-waking up, but another fence gone because we were kind of saying, look, you know, maybe it'd be nice if we could film you like shaking hands with older brothers and sisters and greeting them and stuff. And I had envisioned that conversation being like, oh my goodness, yes, what a great, I love doing that. And it was a bit like, oh, if, if we've got time, you'll need to check with this brother, he's got my schedule and and it was less enthusiastic than I was otherwise expecting. I mean, to be fair to the guy, he's getting on a bit, so I would, I would want to do it necessarily at his age, but it was a, a bit of a wake You imagine up. in your mind as a Jehovah's Witness, he's like, yeah, let's do this, yeah. it will encourage the brothers. Exactly, and... yeah. This is what you know mm. I do every week at the congregation and I'm happy to do it here, and, mm. but it was um, more of a, not a task, but more... Begrudgingly done. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair to say, yeah. yeah. So then we, we had to kind of go with like his team, I guess, or the people that were managing the schedule for him and, and make sure that there was time. And in the end, he did it. And, but it was just a different reaction than what I was expecting. Sure. Yeah. Those were the things that kind of stand out for me and probably I'm going to be kicking myself at some later point. I'm going to be thinking, I should have asked him about that. Because um, there were so many interesting stories that you were telling us. <laughs> were there, are there, is there anything that's kind of that you feel is really telling, or something that really helps to explain Bethel culture that 
perhaps viewers won't know about or, or would find helpful from your experience? <laughs> Basically anything from this list. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. I think that's the... Uh, so, like, um, I, something that was really interesting for me was there's a... a um, well, how the vaccine situation is this kind of stance of we're neutral, it's a personal choice. Mm. But in Bethel, like we were uh, like praying at our morning worship that we get the vaccine, that we get enough, that the, I think even maybe that the production of the vaccine would roll, uh, roll out well and this kind of stuff. You were praying for vaccine. Right. Which I thought was a bit odd because it's a, technically a personal decision i mean i'm mm. oh sorry <laughs> but i i'm pro uh vaccine and it sounds like the organization is pro vaccine but that's not what we say we're neutral and so i just find that a bit odd like considering like other things that we were doing that were actually pro the organization is closeted pro vaccine right <laughs> which is just an odd thing and yeah. i mean you kind of get that in the congregation anyway from the the letters that are read and and the information you get there but when you're seeing like i guess behind the curtain a little bit as well you really see that this is not a this is not a neutral issue this is a unless you've got a good reason you should be doing this which is great but why do you not say that mm. <laughs> um and other things like um I think the corona time was probably the most interesting, A, because mm. I had the most time to think and um, observe, but also the, the decision-making process in that time was, was super interesting. Like there's um, a, I don't know what I'm gonna call it yet, but there's a video I wanna make about um, how, um, there's this kind of trolley issue, I won't get into it, but in Germany, in the branch territory, there was very quickly a kind of flip-flop, flip-flop problem uh, with the ministry that I found so interesting because I, because I'm an elder in the congregation, I'm also getting the other side of the branch information. And over time in Bethel, you, you learn to read what is actually meant and where this is coming from and who's probably done this. And so seeing not a huge life-changing uh, or life-threatening situation, but a flip-flop in my mind um, in the field whilst being in Bethel was uh, just the most interesting thing. And I don't think it's very well known at all because it was just in our branch territory. So it's not, it wasn't a worldwide policy or anything. And that's, oh, that's what makes it even more interesting is when you get to these decisions where you've got the worldwide policy, Maybe you've got a branch uh, territory policy, maybe the country specifically, um, or maybe it's just something like your elders have made up uh, or, or one elder has a bee in the bonnet and where decisions get made and how is, I find very interesting. I've always found interesting. Weren't you saying as well that it's, it's kind of like a different organization depending on which branch you're in? Different branches have drastically different ways of doing things. Yeah, a thousand yeah. percent, yeah. So. Like my experience in Britain, but like Britain branch was fine, but it, and I didn't have anything to compare it to, but it was, I can't speak to it now, but it was when I was there very, very strict um, generally and in comparison to the Central Europe branch, where like in comparison you have unbelievable freedoms. Mm. Um, like in Britain branch, if someone saw you with a couple of cans of beer in the hand walking around Bethel, and I don't know, maybe you had flip-flops or something, or you would get counseled about that. That's, a, that's an issue. Um, whereas in Celtas, it was like you put the branch committee are doing it. It's very chilled and relaxed. And so the culture, not just of the country, but also more so of the branch, I find interesting as well. I visited a couple of other branches and you see basically who's in the branch committee is that effect that it has then on the culture of the branch and the rules or leniency of the rules and yeah and and even the religion itself is that's an, another thing on the list is that that i think you experienced this as well in croatia that the religion in the country especially if you've never 
been for a long time in a congregation in another country, you think that's the religion and you are told this is how it is worldwide and everyone's doing the same thing, everyone's studying the same watchtower, everything's the same. But when you actually move, that's not really true because the culture of the country and the culture of even probably the branch seems through to the congregations so that rules that are really important in one country are not that important mm. in another and vice versa. And, and it's an odd thing to go through because maybe now you're, you're co constantly breaking this rule that was not a problem before at all. Like it, it really wasn't a rule, it was like a suggestion almost. Um, but now it's like a stark or um, English, a very hard lined rule. Mm. Um, and that's super interesting because you think, well, it should be the same. Why could someone maybe even potentially get punishment or maybe not disfellowship, but, but get restrictions for doing something here? Whereas if they did it in another country in all the same terms, they could talk about that with the elder body like it was nothing. I find that super interesting. You can't get beer in the London Bethel. No. But in the German Bethel, they're so determined to have beer that they've let someone set up uh, an actual shop as their business. Right. Selling beer directly to Bethelites on Bethel premises. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I, the majority of the shop, I think, is probably beer. I mean, that fits. It's, it's, I'm not complaining and I don't <laughs> think it should change. Yeah. But it's, but it's a huge difference. Isn't yeah. It? Night and day. Yeah. Yeah. And I also love the story. It's all coming back to me now. <laughs> the the real WOL, WOL, the real Watchtower Online Library, yeah. that is accessible to Bethelites, goes all the way back to I think eighteen sixty. I don't. I can't remember the exact date, but it goes back. Yeah, Into that's the really 19th interesting. Century. Yeah, yeah. So um, you you were making the point that. Jehovah's Witnesses might think, well, the reason why we only go back to 1950 for the Watchtowers and 1970 for the Awakes and for the books and booklets is because, you know, it would be too much work to put all of those extra decades, you know, digitally available online. But you're yeah. saying the work's it's already been done. It's already available, but only to Bethelites. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the things that I'll cover first in a video is... is mm. That was really interesting because I had reasoned that way that like the reason that you can't get to all of the older stuff is not necessarily because it's got damning things in it. It's just because, I mean, that's a lot of work, you know, to go mm -hmm. in because you can't just, you know, scan the PDF and upload it. You've got to make sure the text is correct. And it's a whole process of, of digitalizing old books that may not be super legible anymore if your copy's not clean or... That's a, a huge amount of work, and so that would, for me, was a logical conclusion. But yeah, when they announced that, oh, you know, now you can, now that you've got Bethel access to this, and it's all just there, that was really interesting. Then what you can suddenly, or is available to you, but what, like, why is it available to me yeah. and not to someone else? Why available to Bethelites but not available to ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah, and I think even you have it's, you have to be a Bethel elder to get access to it. So it's oh, like really? another. It's it is just odd. Like why why is that the level? I mean, like with apostasy, it's like well, there's no level where where you're strong enough to to resist that. So don't look at it, no matter who you are. But apparently. There's a, something similar with the, like your, your normal witnesses shouldn't read it, but there's a level that you can get to where now you're able to get to this information, which I find an interesting policy or interesting stance on it. It's, for, it's irritating for me as well because, you know, bear in mind, you have this really strong anti apostate rhetoric where they're saying, you know, the apostates are out to mislead you. Yeah. You know, they're saying things that are laced with truth, but mostly it's lies, and they're basically withholding information. Another way we can contribute to the oneness, rejecting false stories that are designed to separate us from Jehovah's organization. As an example, think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? Just a few drops of poison in a drink are enough to cause serious harm. 
that apostates often mix a few truths with uh, lies. For one thing, we must reject apostate lies and the false stories of other opposers which are designed to sow doubt and weaken faith. Satan is very skilled at using innuendo, half-truths, and lies. And yet here you have an organization that has all of its publications available digitally but won't make them available to the ordinary. is literally actively withholding that information. And I think we all know why. Mm. It's because it's utterly damning. You know, the 1934 yearbook, Declaration of Facts, Rutherford saying what he thinks of Jewish people. If most Jehovah's Witnesses read that on their screens, on their... Tablets or whatever. Mm. That would be, wow. I did not know it was that kind of organisation back then, you know. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's... It is annoying because then you naturally, like during the waking up process, you have, you find some old PDF or something of a book mm. and you're questioning, well, is, has this been doctored? Has this... And, and actually, the organisation could co not correct it, but, but come out with factual information on the, on the fact, but they withhold that, which then casts all these doubts on what you're actually reading. Is this true? Is this? Mm. But they have the ability to put that to one side and say, well, there's a source that you can go to to check what the old publication says, mm. but they don't make it available. So that's interesting, like what's on there and what, like some there's additional categories and stuff that's what i something that i wanted or oh, hopefully by now have talked about and yeah it's all if it's not on your channel yet it will be at some point yes um, <laughs> and i also found it really interesting when you were talking about the culture and the for want of a better expression office politics and how some people know how to play the game yeah. in order to advance up the ladder more quickly. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of an un... There's a phrase to describe it, and it is an un... Not an unwritten rule, but everyone knows that this happens. Mm. Um, like everyone, even if you're really in the organisation, you, you see that this happens. But it's interesting that it nevertheless works. Like, you can come in and if you play the game, like, I could probably school someone to... To what to do in Bethel to get to where you want to go. And that's interesting that, A, that's something that you can find out with time. The cock has just crowed three times, so we now <laughs> know that you, you've betrayed the organisation. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sorry. Um, go on. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, it's four times now, so, so we're okay. good. <laughs> I'm safe. Um, you yeah. could school someone. It, it, there, there's almost an unwritten playbook right. on how to climb the ladder. Yeah, which is really interesting that everyone understands that this exists. The fact that it works and continues to work despite everyone knowing that people... I mean, it's quite judgmental to say that people do this, but you can very clearly see some people doing... If, that, if this imaginal book, uh, imaginary book exists, mm -hmm. they're doing every step in that imaginary yeah. book. Yeah. So you come to the conclusion where you are Playing the book, uh, playing the game, and then they get a a cool job or whatever they are after. You, they will generally get. Um, and it's interesting. You can come in and be very experienced and very knowledgeable and a real asset. But if you're not playing the game or or not really not playing the game because you think, well, I'm experienced and I'm okay, and if you're just leaning purely on your, your own experience, yeah. you're you're very quickly. Um, or for, how can I say it? I, in my experience, those kind of people do not last very long. So knowing that, and you know, seeing that firsthand as a Bethelite, when you think about the governing body members and the governing body helpers and mm. how how high they are in the hierarchy, is it conceivable that? They're kind of tricksters a little bit and they're kind of playing the system or have played the system. I'm not able to answer it yet because I feel like I'm still very much, I mean, I'm a couple of days outside of Bethel. Mm. Um, I, as things currently stand, I still hold to the fact that I, I think a lot of them are, they're just old guys who don't, once you get into the Bethel rat race and you're on the wheel, 
you're really not thinking very much anymore. You're just kind of pedaling. Like I feel like I was. And I feel like once you've done that long enough, it's conceivable for me to think that you're just running on the wheel. Uh, it's conceivable also that you've played the game, you've got to where you wanted, but I haven't yet uh, drawn conclusions on what I think. So the jury's still out on that? Yeah. So if, if a, someone watching was to put the question to you, as they often do to me, yeah. is the governing body cynical or are they deluded? You would say they're mostly just deluded. As it currently stands, I think that would be my position, yeah. But you reserve the right to change that position. In yeah, the I mean, to be honest, everything I say, I reserve yeah. the right to change my position <laughs> because it's all so new and, yeah. and, and changing. Like with, with sexuality, it was, it, you, I'm still finding my footing, I, mm. I guess. Okay. Now, in terms of what happens next, yeah. you're going to be with us for a few more days in Croatia and then you fly back to the UK. I'm not going to go into too much detail as to what your plans are from then, but just to kind of convey the fact that this is all still very new and like an ongoing situation at the time that we're filming, you're going to be... Um, having your cards transferred to a new congregation. Right. And are you going to be like attending Zoom meetings as an elder after we've had this interview? <laughs> um, I don't know yet. I, right. I'm in an ideal world, no. Um, but I might have to a little bit so that the cards transfer nicely, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a possibility. I, <laughs> cross that bridge when I get yeah, to it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I guess for me, it's ju it's just fascinating because this whole situation highlights the fact that when the organisation suggests, as it routinely does, look, there's eight and a half million Jehovah's Witnesses, and we're all on the same page, and everyone recognises the authority of the governing body. You know, as I've repeatedly said, they just cannot say that. Mm. because I'm getting, you know, voicemails through from PIMO elders, PIMO physically and mentally out elders and ministerial servants who no longer believe and they're going to the meetings. Right. And you're, <laughs> you were felt that way as a Bethelite for months and that's yeah. in Bethel. Yeah. That's like near the apex of the organisation. So they simply cannot say that all eight and a half million are on the same page because quite clearly that I think you're living proof of the fact that they're not, you know? Yeah, I think it also speaks to the fact that it's not that people want to be dishonest, it's that there's no way you can be honest. Mm. Like if there was a way of, you know, walking into Bethel office and saying, look, I don't really think this is legit anymore or I'm thinking, I'm questioning this or, mm. and there was a way for that to conceivably play out Without then, harsh penalties. Yeah, then of course you would do it. But mm. because the, because you know, especially as an elder, you know exactly where this path is going to go. Mm. And, and ha every conversation with every person you've already had in your mind, because you know how people react, how very, um, for lack of a better word, indoctrinated witnesses react, um, how the people react in Bethel, all, you know it. So you, there's no point going down especially once you've realized or you've woken up going down that route of trying to reason it out and think in your current position, you have to kind of, <laughs> I guess, plan an escape or, or, or come to terms with the fact that you just have to kind of lie, which is such a odd position to find yourself in from your previous state, which is I, tell the truth so much that I go to people's stores to tell them the truth. Like I'm the most honest person in my, well, for lots of people, you're, you're being very honest all mm. the time. Mm. Um, and then to suddenly find yourself in a position where you're not only lying, but you're, you're forced to lie for survival. It's such an odd transition. Mm. Um, and I, yeah. Two or three days before we, got you out mm -hmm. um you <laughs> oh no <laughs> you found yourself 
in a very stressful situation and we had a WhatsApp exchange and it was all looking very scary. Can you relive some of that and, and explain what happened? <laughs> I will try. Um, yeah, so... Um, Oh man! Is this bringing back <clears throat> memories now? It's yeah. it's a, it's uncomfortable, yeah. So, yeah. To tell a long story short, I um, I'm trying to think about what I should say. Yeah, I understand because other people are involved in the story, and you, you're right. wanting to think about what their wishes are. Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's fair to say that. Um, a very good friend of mine um, went went on a journey went on the journey with me, mm. and then um, came up with a plan and was executing that plan. It didn't go quite as um, as planned, and so then it raised some suspicion in Bethel about apostasy and um, the spreading of misinformation and so on. So I, I was uh, called into a meeting with um, some elders that I know very, very well and kind of, for lack of a better word, grilled about the situation, about this very, very close friend, about their current s stance, what they're thinking, contact with them, what I think, do I have doubts, what's my situation, have I been looking at anything apostate, et cetera, et cetera. But that was not, I was not aware that that's where this meeting, I thought it was like a, thanks for coming to Bethel, see you later. Oh, so it was a total surprise from what you had in mind. Complete, yeah. yeah. So I was very, in fact, I was prepared for, well, in all honesty, I was prepared for a meeting of, you know, thanks for, do you have any suggestions or anything that we could have done better? I kind of had prepared, like, well, I think, you know, you should do this, and this is a bit naff. And, yeah. and at the beginning, there was all these questions about, you know, how I feel about kind of people in power and so. And I was, ex that's how I, I expected this conversation to go. So I, I was pretty honest. I was like, well, I'm going to be honest. Some of them are, I don't know why they have this. Um, which in hindsight was not a great answer to be given. If you'd have known what direction it was going to go in, you would have, <laughs> oh, would have, they, they're fantastic. Yes. The brothers are, are wonderful. Yes, and... but I thought it was a bit, um, <laughs> they caught me off guard. Yeah. Um, and it was very, and then all of a sudden it became very clear. I, they, they were directly talking about this to me, like watching my reactions and how I reacted to their questions and everything. And I didn't know... Um, if they knew what they knew, if this is me, if this is someone else that I'm aware of, or what, what this, what's the situation? Mm. Fortunately, I, I don't know how, because I clearly, <laughs> from this conversation, I struggle to form sentences. So in a high stress situation where every word is very carefully um, could come over, back to haunt you. over yeah. analyzed, right? Yeah. Somehow, I managed to dodge the bullet, I guess, and and um, you were able to reassure them that you weren't <laughs> part of this infestation of apostasy due to this friend of yours who who'd gotten out and was making apparently very. Um, distressing noises from the organization's perspective. Yeah, which is, I really, it really, it, it, I don't get annoyed really ever, but I guess that's as close as I get because it's, because I'm forced to lie. Mm. Like it wasn't like, look, you can be, even though they say, look, you can be totally honest here. If I'm totally honest, say, well, Lloyd's coming to pick me up <laughs> in two days. <laughs> that doesn't go well. No. So, so you so you just you have to lie and you can't it's not just lying on a form mm. or lying to someone at the post office yeah. it's it's lying to two people you've known for 6 years that you like that you care about very much yeah and 
and to their faces mm. in a conversation where they've asked you to be brutally honest it's horrible it this is why it's so uncomfortable because i'm i guess my my conscience is so ashamed that i've done that it's it, even though you know why you did it yeah but it's still this is something we were chatting about in the car is the relationships you make in Bethel, the, the, still in my mind, I can't say all, but at least my friends or the people I hanged around with Bethel, I love very much, like even still. And I know they're never going to wake up and this is over. But these are, in my mind, inherently good people who don't, simply just don't understand um, and will likely never. And they're your friends and family and they're who you go to when your parents are sick and you can't go home or when you're struggling in lockdown because you you just want to go to the cinema or something. They, they help you through everything. And when you're put in a position where you have to knowingly lie and then know that they're going to find out and they're going to remember that conversation and think, this guy's horrible. He's lied to my... It's very... Uh, it's probably, I, f I don't think it's an over-exaggeration to say it's probably the most awful I felt about s something I think I've done. I feel so ashamed about it, even though I understand why and I know why and, and it's not for fear of not getting into paradise or anything anymore. It, it, it's, it's just a horrible, like if you imagine that you, that you have a very good relationship with people and someone's looked after you and every, I think most people have someone in their life like that and you're forced to lie knowing that they're gonna find out, hate you, never speak to you again and not something you prepared for, it happens in conversation mm. and, and there are dramatic consequences if you don't Tell them what they want to hear, that, yeah. yeah it's a horrible situation to be in mm. and I in some ways am thankful I think that I probably will never have to deal like if they wake up and I have to or oh, I'm able to talk to them that would I think it will haunt me forever that conversation is that was that was that element of of it the deception the most traumatizing traumatizing element of the whole situation for you yes because because it's just not in my nature. I, yeah. I mean, every, sure, no one's like, well, it, it, pe not many people are like, oh, I love lying to people. It is, I, it's just uncomfortable being deceptive and, and just lying to your friends. It's horrible. I, mm. I, I mean, you could argue, I guess, I'm trying to think how I would think watching myself speak. It's like, well, you lied to yourself about being gay for 20 years, but it's, it's you're deceiving others. Like every day when you get up in Bethel and you're not, you don't fully believe in what's happening, it's very draining, but it's also, I felt like you're deceiving everyone. Like the days when I could take holiday or, or for whatever reason weren't at work, we're such a relief because you can just, you don't, you just, you're not lying about the situation. So then to, at the very last minute, be confronted, which I hadn't had before, directly in the face. I mean, it, many people have, will have had judicials and things of that, and that's already uncomfortable. But when you're an elder and you know these guys very well, you know, all the challenges and situations they've been through in their personal lives, in the stuff they've dealt with judicially or whatever before and and they're your friends and you've built a, a close relationship with them it, it yeah i don't know how to describe it is just so uncomfortable and uh, yeah i you're, you're still trying to get your head around it that's this yeah. still that's probably i don't think i will like this week or this I think it will take some time to get over that conversation yeah. Yeah. because it was quite, it's a position that I don't ever want to be in again. No, no. Yeah. And hopefully we'll never be in again. 
hopefully. Unless you get into another cult. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, let's see. <laughs> so, um, what's next for you? What, you've got a long journey ahead. Uh, Again, I don't, want, I don't want you to feel like you have to divulge personal information, but what's your plan now that you are out of Bethel? Yeah, so... Actually, this is a good opportunity. The, the, like I, I'm sure lots of people are familiar when you're waking up, you go through this, your emotions are all over the place. And in probably one of the deepest, just after like the deepest low point for me, where like your, your physical health is, is, has taken a toll because of the stress of it all. Um, I read somewhere on Reddit, uh, um, or somewhere, someone, was writing something about being in a very similar position and something that helped them was realizing that they as a kid and, and growing up or whatever previously they'd had kind of a dream or something they wanted to pursue that they weren't able to because for whatever reason the organization organization restricted it or was against it or that's not something they could do like go skydiving or something you know something that just isn't possible uh, but now knowing that it is possible, pursuing that or, or doing the thing that you the thing you wanted to previously, had helped them get direction and and to move on, and that really helped me, I guess, emotionally with the whole process, and that's kind of where I'm at now. So I I kind of picked up my old dream that I had on the floor and thought that's never going to happen. I mean, because even in paradise, that's not going to be a thing. So, uh, so I picked that up and I'm going to pursue my, the old, old Ben dream. <laughs> the authentic Ben dream. Yes. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> and what is that dream? Uh, well, I'm going to fail so bad, but I, um, I lo I'm a real nerd. I mean, you may no. have... This is actually Surely really not. interesting. I haven't worn this shirt in... t laughing because we had quite a few nerdy conversations in the car drive here, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a fair statement then mm. that I am very much a nerd. I haven't worn this shirt, in fact, like in six, because of Bethel in so long, but mm. I'm happy that I'm in, I can embrace, can embrace my inner, inner Jedi. Fan, yeah. 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 Um, so I always want... Well, actually, I guess for my career, I shouldn't be so specific, but I, there was a, a definite company that I always wanted to work for. And, um, and it would be great if I could be somehow involved in th that whole world and, and technology. And so to pursue that dream, it's a very long journey. And so the f one of the first steps is um, either to learn um, how that world so is learn those skills learn the skills um and so the route that i kind of have chosen to go about is then to to attend university higher education to, <laughs> you're waiting <laughs> it is one thing to work on a job with others and quite another matter to immerse oneself in an institution of learning i have long said the better the university the greater the danger the most intelligent and eloquent professors will be trying to reshape the thinking of your child. And their influence can be tremendous. Yes, um, to obtain the skills to, to make that dream a reality. Even if it doesn't go exactly as planned, going on that journey is, is really exciting. At the moment, my feelings are so overshadowed by the last thing we spoke about, that everything is so still quite doomy and, and emotional, but I'm really looking forward to actually doing that and, yeah. and, and being hopefully at some point able to say, yeah, I can, I can code now and I can do this and understand science and, and, mm. and that's, Super interesting to me. So higher education is poised to be your savior in terms of helping you yeah. have a dream and stick to it. Yeah. I think as well, because of 
I have been quite fortunate in the way that it works um, in that I'm going to be much older than some of the, or most of the other students, but... But you're still only, I think, 27. Right. So it's still... Exactly. And it's, it's that time, from what I understand, in normal people's lives, when you kind of are figuring out, like, what, what's my political, political stance, or what, how do I feel about this? And they are asking those kind of questions, mm. which are exactly the same questions that I'm now going through, because until now I didn't have a political stance or mm. so figuring all of that out in an environment that is conducive is that yeah. the word yeah great conducive to helping people in that situation is is a great um it's fortunate I think well all I can say is it's been an absolute privilege I know we use that word a lot, or we used it as Jehovah's Witnesses a lot, but it's been a real privilege watching and helping you on your journey. I am fascinated to see where things go in the future, fascinated to see what videos you make, and probably more than anything, fascinated to see you build a new life where you can be true to yourself and you can explore your dreams, love whoever you want to love, and just, yeah, enjoy life, enjoy this brilliant thing called life, but... I guess all that remains is to say congratulations on your freedom. Thanks. And we're here for you. Thank okay. you.